Hello. Now that's been a week and a half, hasn't it? Welcome to the Battle of Texiel. Now, this is one of those interesting battles, and it's one of the reasons why I haven't produced this recording any time sooner is because, honestly, I have been worried about getting it right. About getting it right in terms of, well, getting it right in terms of do I give the right balance to the right admirals? It's rare you're in a scenario where you're looking at it and you're going, actually, some of the better sources are coming from the defeated side in terms of the profile of the admirals versus the victory side because of some of the cultural biases, but also some of the more... How do I put this? More ingrained viewpoints. That are coming through. So hopefully I have managed to get the gain and everything right on this and everything is going well and you're able to hear me perfectly because honestly this is the fourth recording but I've been to the previous three because I didn't think I got the balance right. So today's battle is the Battle of Texiel in 1673. Now, the problem of depending upon allies. There are lots of issues here, and people will think I'm talking about one side, and actually, I could well be talking about the other side. Because both sides are, in a funny way, alliances. Okay. The English and the French might be different nations, but the Dutch are comprised of different admiralties, different groups producing the ships. Because of the way the Dutch have set up their provinces and the way they're organized, that is how they produce their navy at this time. So they're very different. Ah, <sighs> bilge pumps. Sorry, I, I, I should probably have put a new meme, and I will probably pick a new meme at some point, but I like this meme because it's quite true. <laughs> oh well I should probably say please remember to like, share, subscribe if you enjoy. Because as you'll know at the moment, technically, due to the joy that is covered, this is my professional income, so I should professionalize these things. But the fun stuff is bilge pumps and the fun stuff is doing this. It gives me something to do other than sit at home and think, well, I'm working in my bedroom and lecturing from my bedroom. Which is a lovely room, but it's kind of, t you can, uh, and trust me, I picked the camera angle very carefully because you can kind of tell if you pan more that way that I have condensed two university office spaces. Um, and stuff from around the house because of the necessity of not being able to go out into what was my bedroom rather than my primary working space. There are literally towers of books everywhere. The whole camera apparatus is built upon a tower of books. Um, you can't see it, but there are literally a stack of four big boxes of books there, another four there with a railway on top of them, uh, another four in the far corner, and another four there. And it's it, it's it's a fun time. So, why am I telling you all this? Well, I'm basically saying this is what it is like when you are living in an alliance scenario. A house is a household is an alliance. You have to adjust to meet your, the needs of you and the needs of the people around you. You have to make accommodations. Luckily, one of those accommodations, which very frankly my family has decided to do, is we are going to be getting the office in the garden. Um, I'm doing all the work building the inside, and in return, my sister is putting it on her credit card. We're both going to get our own offices. 
They are going to be separated by a wall. We're both lecturers, we're both quite loud speakers. You need a wall and probably a couple extra layers of soundproofing, which I'm going to add in to between us. It's easier that way. But that's a good thing. But that now means uh, my funding goal now, I suppose, if, if I'm talking about my finances, is to save enough money to buy the various amounts of marine ply I'm planning to use to build all the furniture out of, well, all the shelving out of. Because it's going to be in the garden, and despite it being waterproof and all these other things, it seems sensible to make these things out of marine ply. That's not just because I was trained in woodwork first by a naval architect slash shipwright, and have a deep affection for marine ply as being a very reliable source of structural strength, and... Um, <clears throat> Uh, well, surviving in pretty much everything. It's also because it actually makes a jolly good wood for preserving books and looking after them. I'm still not quite sure about how I'm going to go about building the um, doors and the cupboards. I might buy those because I'm not so good at finicky glass work. But I'll think about that. Anyway, so, houses and lights. And you have to make accommodations. Well, this is true with the Dutch, and this is true with the English and the French. The English and the French are an alliance which live in separate houses. The Dutch are an alliance of the same house. Theoretically, one should produce a far more common purpose. And it does, but it doesn't necessarily produce a good common history. If you think about any of your family's retelling of events, usually they're not always 100% balanced. Whereas if you think about alliances of other houses, that can get very complicated very quickly. Oh, and a quick announcement while we're on the bilge pumps. Next week, we have, for the recording next week, so it'll be coming out in two weeks, Commander Salamander coming on, or are coming to join in the crew to discuss the future of warship design. It's becoming a bit of a theme. We get in guests to discuss the future of war and the future of warships because it's quite a cool thing for us to discuss. Um, so I hope you're going to enjoy that. We're very excited. <laughs> We're all big fans. We're sort of going, yeah, would, would you like to come on Bilge Pumps? And he went, yes. And we were all going, <laughs> Right. A little context. Uh, the Battle of Shawnwells. Okay. How do I describe the Battle of Shawnwells without sounding biased? They were terrible. Absolutely atrocious. Awful. How not to run a battle. Completely and utterly. Yeah. <sighs> Okay, so Rupert has his deputy commander aboard his ship meeting him. The Dutch hove into view. He sends his deputy commander back to his ship. But before he gets there, he thinks he's not going to make it. So he decides to change the order of the fleet without telling anyone that he's changing the order of the fleet. And the French are supposed to be in front of his squadron. And the English squadron of Sprague is supposed to be in front of the French. But... Rupert decides that he's going to change his round. He doesn't send any flag signals. He doesn't tell anyone. He just tells his squadron to follow him. And the French think, well, we have to be in front. So we have to go in front of him. So you've got him racing to take over the French, racing to keep in front, and the English fleet doing... Why put a cavalry commander in charge of a navy? And not even a good cavalry commander. If someone told me they want to put Cromwell in charge of a fleet, I'd understand that. I'd go, there's a decent cavalry commander who will keep control of his force at least. And one good thing about Cromwell, you might not like many uh, things about him, but he does communicate with his subordinates and tell them clearly what he's doing. <sighs> Rupert. This is not the last time you're going to hear me swearing about Rupert. I'm not a big fan. Anyway, wait a second, and this is going to disappear everything. Charles II of Britain is humiliated by the Dutch. 
um, pretty much the Dutch in decide that if you're going to declare war on us, we're going to nick your fleet. We're not going to, and to be honest, Charles thought he'd already won the war, so he decided he didn't need to pay for the fleet, he could save money, and the Dutch come and nick it. Anyone who thinks Charles is a bit of a twit, please say yes. Actually, no. That's unfair. He's fairly decent as um, kings of Britain go at this period. Uh, that's the other thing. Uh, I keep seeing this uh, kings of England and the English and the English fleet and this and that thing. Um, that may as not be technically true, but they're serving King Charles II, who is kings of England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland, um, which at this time collectively would be called Britain. And more importantly, that his fleet, his force, is there is definitely British in composition. It has Scots, it has Welsh, it has an Irishman leg. No, Spag. Oh, yeah, Spag. Sorry, I keep calling him Leg for some reason. As its second senior admiral, we're going to go with British. Okay. So, it's kind of fun uh, that basically Louis XIV loses the first round. Because despite. Charles of being humiliated in 1667. In 1668, he works out with the Dutch to stop the Spanish conquest, uh, uh, the French conquest of Spanish Netherlands. Why? Because it's not in Britain's interest for the French to control that much of the coast facing them. Uh, but they're not happy. And so Charles therefore decides that, well, War with the Dutch might not be popular, but it'd be good to humble them. It would be good to humble them. And he then proceeds to do some real politic, which, frankly, Bismarck would have been proud of, to pay for it. Uh, the French land offensive was, as always with the French land offensives, fairly successful. They are good at these things. At sea. There were, unfortunately, three battles. Schoenveld, the two of them, and Texiel, but also Solbay. Pretty much all these battles were not very good for the, uh, for, the British, uh, for the British and the French. They didn't work well together. They didn't have good command structures. Their commanders were technically insanely silly. And then, well, let's see. It carries on. So, at, after the, as well as the blockades, there was also French troops penetrated and managed to reach even further into side, um, the heart of the Republic. Uh, this led to the fall of Johann de Witt, the Grand Pensionary, and the appointment of William III of Orange as Stadtholder. This Charles II fought was great, as William was Charles's nephew. Married to his niece, James the Second, Charles's younger brother's um, daughter. Um, so Charles proposed, thinking his nephew would definitely go along with it, uh, that the province of Holland be made an English protection rump state with William as its monarch. Can't think why William didn't approve of this. Um, you know, we all do as our uncles tell us to, always, um, especially our uncles by marriage. And he was actually very, very surprised that the uh, that he refused the demands to occupy strategic ports. And, um, well, the Dutch are clever. What they do... which shows their natural love of the water, 
is they decide that the best way to stop the French while negotiations are going on is to flood their own country and prevent the French advancing any further. And it works. Wasn't the first time they did it. It won't be a lot. It probably wasn't the last. It wasn't the last time they did it. I don't. At the moment, currently, there isn't much chance of them having to do it again. But you never know if Putin gets particularly rapacious, or um, I don't know, something weird goes on. One should never rule out history repeating itself. Well, at least rhyming. And then we have 1617-3. We have the victories of Dorotia. And then we have the fact that the French have managed to piss off the Germans. <laughs> Not for the first time in history. And the British get their first lesson in how to control the French. Because the Dutch... Bankroll the Germans to beat up the French. And it works! The British go, we like that technique. We will copy that technique. Shamelessly copy that technique. Regularly copy that technique. And not only do the British lose several battles, but William launches a campaign, a propaganda campaign, the first hearts, minds, and fake news influence campaign to claim that the alliance of France was part of a plot to make the Brit UK, uh, make Britain Roman Catholic, and this all leads to the um, second piece of Westminster. Although France and the Dutch keep fighting. Hey, <sighs> caramba. Basically, it's a Protestant alliance paid for by the Dutch and combined with a load of medium uh, manipulation. So the next time someone tells you that media control doesn't win wars and media influence doesn't affect the outcome of wars, A, you can tell them that you can go back as far as the third Dutch, Anglo-Dutch war and find tangible evidence it does. Secondly, you can tell them from me that it's not a new technique. Using media, using information to spread, uh, using uh, various forms of printing, press, and dissemination to spread fake news or real news to influence the wider public and especially the political classes of your opponent is nothing new. Seriously, not new. So, please, every time someone jumps up and goes, this is the information warfare age, it's brand new. Just smile at them politely and go, have you read much on the Third Anglo-Dutch War? And when they go, no, go, go have a look. Now, anyone for crumpets? Right, this is one of the paintings of the battle, and you can see the Dutch ships bedecked in their beautiful, beautiful flags and signalling, and all the sails out. For some reason, there aren't that many um, English portrayals of the battle. I can't think why, or British portrayals of the battle. Um, I can't think why. What's really interesting is Rupert spends half his life commissioning paintings, but he doesn't seem to get involved in this one. So, the battle takes place 21st of August, 1673. Uh, it's in the North Sea. It's, this, <laughs> uh, it, it, it's rather like a battle, of the, a battle of Jutland. It seems to be something about North Sea battles. They often end up with um, tactically indecisive strategic victory. For the Dutch, as long as they didn't lose, they won. Okay? The whole point was the British wanted to get troops to the Netherlands. If the British landed an army 
behind, even a small army, and this was the Blackheath army, behind the Dutch lines and cause them to have to abandon a section of what they were protecting so that the French could cross the flooded areas, it was over. That was it. It was that simple. They either would have to ignore the troops landed by the British, or they would have to abandon the fighting the French. So De Ritter was critical to William's plans. If De Ritter failed, Southern Netherlands, which you can understand why he's become such a folk hero and why he's remembered as a grandfather on the Navy. I'm less worried about that. I think De Ritter uh, uh, has earned his place. However, Trump and me are going to have an interesting conversation in a second. That's probably going to get me a lot of hate mail. Sometimes. Anyway, you have the com principal commanders and leaders are Michael de Ritter, Cornelius Trump, and Edren Bankit. And you have Prince Rupert, Edward Sprague, and Jean de Estres on the, on the Allied side. Theoretically, let's look at these facts. Strength of the Dutch was 75 warships. Strength of the Allies was 92 warships. Strength in terms of fire ships of the Dutch, 30 fire ships. Strength from the Allies, 30 fire ships. Casualties and losses, 1,000 killed versus 2,000 killed. 1,000 for the Dutch, 2,000 for the Allies. I'd say it's a tactical victory for the Dutch as well, honestly, but I'm, you know, that's probably going to put me in a minority here. And please note, fire ships are a critical point still, as we did the Battle of Cape Glanzo and all these things. Fire ships are still part of the formation. They're still critical. Why? Because you're breaking up formations, and that's what fire ships will do. But also because of the eh, very interesting design of ships that you get with Man of War. It's an interesting one. But again, on paper, the Allies should have won that battle. It's not a massive numerical superiority. 92 to 75, it's, you know, 17 ships. But that 17 ships which are unmarked by enemy gunfire, in theory, that 17 ships which you should be able to roll up the enemy with. And remember, every time you knock out an enemy ship, that increases your numbers, your superiority of number. And you're more likely to knock out enemy ships because you're able to concentrate two or three of the un focused on ships fire on a single enemy ship. If you can coordinate and control them and actually organize them. Oh, and are prepared to lead them in lead them in a sensible manner. All these things help. So let's look at the Allied commanders. We have Prince Rupert. The king's cousin. Um, who had famously not been, well, he'd been better than average, but that's really not saying much as a royalist general in the War of the Four Kingdoms, otherwise known as the uh, Civil War in Britain, the English Civil War, but seeing as it involves Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, I'm, I'm rather disturbed whenever people call it the English Civil War. We have Edward Sprague, an Irish gentleman, I'm going to get into him a bit later, but frankly, my opinion of him is not that much better. Um, he felt he should be in supreme command, not Rupert, and make his feelings felt. And then we have Jean Comte d'Estres, a uh, son of a Marshal of France. Actually, possibly the most competent commander of the lot, but he is fighting with his hand behind his tied behind his back on the Allied side. Um, and even he doesn't always have success at sea, but he has he does do a fair amount of sea command and 
Okay, he's more successful than others, but again, please note, none of these people are what we'll be talking about when we were talking about John Bing at the Battle of Cape Polariso. They are not professional sailors. Sprague could possibly try and claim to be. Comp this after a mm, not unsuccessful land career. Um, has spent most of his, a large amount of time at sea, and so has Rupert. But they are not sailors. They are commanders. And you see that in how they act. Um, you know, honestly, there's Rupert. I, I... Seriously, those battles. They're just... <sighs> the Dutch commanders. Okay. Well, we have Lieutenant Admiral Michael de Ruyter, Admiralty of the Maas. It's the Admiralty he belongs to. Then we have Cornelius Matheson Trump, Admiralty of Amsterdam. Trump and Sprague will fight a duel in this battle because they like to wind each other up with a war of words. But changing ship. Because they each blast each other's flagships out from underneath each other on more than one occasion, about three occasions. And Sprague, when he's changing ship for the last time, it would turn out to be the boat overturns and he drowns. But don't worry, that little fight has managed to ruin the entire English line and make the whole thing terribly disorganised. But we'll get into that. And then we have, possibly after De Ruyter, the next best admiral at the entire action. And one of the most forgotten admirals. Agent von Trappen Benkert, Admiralty of Zealand. Now, here's the thing. Um, we all know English admirals of the Royal Navy. We know a few Scottish admirals of the Royal Navy. You can think, all think of Duncan, very famous, very successful. Yes, there are there are a few then below him, but Duncan's the big one. We can think of a few Irish admirals of the Royal Navy. How many Welsh can you name? I'm not going to answer the question for you. Name a Welsh admiral. Put it in the comments down below. That is, to an extent, like Zealanders. Zealand is the Wales of the Dutch. It just doesn't get it acknowledged. They are produced some of the consistently some of the best sailors in the Dutch Navy, and they are very successful and very good, but they don't get acknowledged. And frankly, Agent van Trappenbacket is one of the best. And I'm going to do a second check because I'm going to say this now, but I want to check it. Yes, I was right. There have been just three ships named for Banquet. Um, let me just check Trump's again. There have been two, four, six, eight, nine ships named Trump, named Reuter. And eight ships named Trump. So, for some reason, Banquet. Despite being one of the best commanders in Dutch history, has three ships to eight for Trump and nine for the grandfather, Reuter. And Trump spends most of the battle waging a personal war with an English admiral, which frankly is just using up ships. <sighs> what can I say? The Admiralty of Amsterdam has better publicists. But I just find it wrong. I, in fact, let's put it this way. Okay. The last 
HNMS Bankat was decommissioned in 1993 and is currently in service with the Greeks as the Argeon. I want to start a campaign now for a next one of the ne next Dutch ships to be called HNMS Bankat. I think he deserves it. For goodness sake, he was one of the critical admiral admirals who ensured the Dutch Republic actually existed in this period, and he is pretty much an afterthought. It's just wrong. So, that's going to be my campaign. I'm going to start that campaign now. I am a rather large, very British, very English-sounding naval historian, but I'm going to start a campaign because I want Banquet to get a ship named after him to start to readdress some of that, uh, some of that, how do I put it, imbalance. Because I can understand the right to having nine. I, I, I could even be acceptable of Trump having six or something, even eight. But I cannot see why Trump has eight and Bankhead has three. I just think that's not fair. That's just wrong to me. It is. In every single one of the Reuters battles at this point, Bankhead ends up being doing doing critical role. And it gets worse because Bankhead becomes a Lieutenant Admiral as well. And during one of the future operations after the Reuters no longer at sea, they actually make the decision to appoint, uh, appoint a junior admiral from another admiralty in charge of their fleet, uh, in charge of the combined fleet, for obvious reasons, because they uh, command the more ships. But it's a great insult to this war, to this hero of the the Republic. It's just, no, I did. Anyway, let's consider some of the ships which took part. The um, The Allied fleet was divided into the white, the blue, and the red squadrons. It's kind of interesting once you start getting into them some of the ways, but some of the names which come out. Warspite. <coughs> it parts of the red squadron. It fights well. Um, Resolution does. Monmouth does. Triumph does. <laughs> All these names. Um, there is also the St. George. There is HMS Unicorn as part of the Blue Squadron, as is HMS Dreadnought, HMS Lion, HMS Dunkirk, HMS Gloucester, HMS Bristol. Also somewhere out there is a Mary Rose as well. Hmm. I don't think it's the Mary Rose. I think it's a different. It's another Mary, Mary Rose, I'm fairly sure. Fairly sure the Mary Rose, we all know, is the one that's uh, has sunk. But anyway. Also, HMS Newcastle, Leopard, all sorts of things. On the Netherlands side, let's, let's see some of these ships burnt out there. Um, the Admiralty of Amsterdam included um, Hollandia. And Oliphant, under Vice Admiral Isaac Swears. Again, he's got ships. And I'm not uh, the good and Lou. Good and Lou. Under um, Lieutenant Admiral Cornelius Trump. Of course, that was one of the pictures you used at the beginning. I think. Or Dinosaur of Marriage. Not sure. Find out in the end. And. Yeah, they're just interesting names. The Seven Provincian is the uh, flagship for, Mike, uh, for Lieutenant Admiral General Michael de Ruyter. It's quite interesting some of the names they give for their fire ships. There's one called Saint Peter. And the Admiralty of Zealand, their vessel is called the Valkren. That's Lieutenant Admiral von Troppen Tra Bankett's uh, ship. Um, let's see. Any other interesting ship names coming up that I can remember? Quite interesting that where the names do come in and what they are for. I just 
printed out a simple list of names. One of those interesting scenarios where I was honestly not sure which was more accurate on the list. Um, the fact that there's Zealandia is part of the Admiralty of the Mares. That's the um, sort of Admiralty of Rotterdam, basically. Um, not part of the Admiralty of Zealand, just speaks so much to me. But they also have the Utrecht. And the Treaty of Utrecht is, of course, is coming up as part of the fun. Anyway, let's go. So the Battle Tech Seal. Um, how do I put this politely? It was terrible. So, theoretically, the Allied fleet was there to blockade in the Dutch so that the amphibious force could go across. The Reuter didn't really want to see go to sea. He wanted to do the same plan he did at Skullmeld, which is just wait for the Allied idiots to bumble into him, and then he would take them out. Uh, useful idiots. We're going to use them that phrase. But William was worried, and William orders him to sea. So he managed to use Banquet to separate the Allied van. So the Cestres is out of the battle. The French are no more. And the French have actually got some problems because they've basically been told, fight, yes, but I don't want to lose any ships by Louis XIV. So they had one hand time hand back. The English, British had been told to take out anything that moved. Unfortunately, Sprague has decided to declare to King Charles that um, he would either kill or capture Trump, and he turns this into a personal battle with him. Honestly, if one of my senior admirals turned around to me and said that I will, uh, my entire purpose for a fight in this fight is to kill or capture one of my opponents, I'd sit there and go, right then, you're dismissed. But apparently Charles II thought it was good fighting vigor. Oh my god. <sighs> Thank god. I, all I can say is that actually Sprague gets... No, it's still terrible, because I'm saying I'm happy that someone was killed. I'm not happy he was killed, but I think probably saved a fair number of more ships for both the English and the Dutch being severely damaged. Sprague, uh, Sprague managing to get overturned when he did. Because him and Trump would have continued on it. We both had this massive image of how great and glorious they are. So basically, Sprague is bashing away at Trump. The French are off over there being taken out by Bankert, who's basically having fun. And then Bankett manages to disengage the French while still leaving them over there, come back, join the Reuter, and, well, destroy, basically beats up Rupert. And they abandon it. Just abandon it. Sensibly. But, Honestly, to say that Rupert is supreme commander is to suggest he's actually he's actually exercising any form of command. I think most of the commands are basically just follow me and charge. And perhaps I am judging them harshly about against later communications and fleet actions and signals, but. And perhaps it's too harsh to accept a modicum of professionality. Perhaps I'm judging them too harsh on this one, but... You see, the thing is, I'm comparing the Allied commanders with the Dutch commanders. And I might have problems with Trump getting as much credit as he does, because I might think he's a very good admiral, but I don't. I think he gets far more credit than he necessarily deserves, especially when it comes to the naming of ships.
but at no point would you really get a scenario, well, maybe Trump again, but that's because he has delusions of being Superman. Um, do you get them putting personal factors ahead of professional? I can understand the French Admiral. He's, again, the most professional Admiral on the Allied side. And he is not really a professional Admiral by any stretch of imagination. And it's battles like this which do lead to the professionalization of the Royal Navy. It is. Experiences like this are what form the Royal Navy just as much as Elder Victories do. And then perhaps this is a lesson also, this sort of battle is a lesson to why you have the commanders have the experience of the sea. Because uh, each side keeps losing and gaining the weather gauge. But the fact is that the Reuter managed to gain it first and gained it more often for longer than Rupert did. Because Rupert couldn't control his force and because his subordinates couldn't be... The whole theory was you had a distributed command structure and... That distributed command structure couldn't be trusted to work. Thank God the Blackheath army never had to be sent in. Oy. So, summary. The Battle of Texiel. And this is going to be one of those sort of not that long summary because I'm doing this all in one. The Battle of Texiel is one of those battles I really enjoy studying. And I really enjoy talking about and discussing because it is not your regular run-of-the-mill battle. Normally when we're talking about battles, when we're talking about actions, we're talking about these things as being straight up wins or losses, what was the strategic concerns, what was the tactics. But this battle, it's all about the command. Frankly, the rest is immaterial, is just a product of it. If the Allies had shown half of as much command cohesion as the Dutch managed to do, and this was with the ego of Trump to manage, then what could have been achieved would have been amazing. It's also in a time where really, it's not as we imagine the Age of Sail being. Fire ships, the importance of them. That's, in some respects, a legacy of the wars of the time of Queen Elizabeth, which are not that long ago. We're talking about 1673. It's less than 100 years since the Spanish Armada. It's definitely less than 100 years since all the issues which have happened with the English Armada to going back to Spain. And it's still in many ways at a time of not refining of military technology, but the cusp of military technology, the, uh, the evolution of military technology. These are men of war, not ships of the line that they're talking about. If you look at Wikipedia and other things, you see them talking about ships of the line, but really they're talking about men of war. That's really what they're sort of thinking about in these central ships. Ships of the line, as we would understand them, are things that are evolving and coming in. And they will come in. They will start to professionalize. They will start to become more and more of the navies we would understand. But in many ways, that's going to take place over the next hundred or so years. Our age of sail navies, that when we're thinking about age of sail navies, are actually far more often the navies from 1700 onwards and into the up to 1850, that sort of period we are talking about when we're talking about age of sail navies and what our image of them is. The pre-1700 age of sail navies are different. Very different. But this battle shows both what can be good and what can be bad. 
Trump is at his best, <clears throat> to an extent, under the Reuters command here. Um, frankly, Sprague, Rupert, quite happily could have replaced them. Not sure who I could have replaced them with. That's also the other trouble. Who do you replace these people with? You know, it takes a while to draw, grow a strategic tactical culture that can generate you to, you to senior officers you need. This is why, more often than not, you do find generals being used as admirals. Because at least you know how, they know how to fight. Might not know very well. And to his, in his defense, Rupert had done well for the royalist cause at sea, broadly speaking. Broadly speaking, basically acting as a privateer. So, what have we got to come out? Well, today it's the Battle of Texel. Um, next Tuesday, it could Crete have been saved in 1941. I'm still debating how to do that. Uh, the Convoy War in the Perfect Storm of PQ-17. And uh, Monday the 31st, Patreon Video 5. Courtesy of Belnora, Mediterranean Gunboat Diplomacy in the Victorian Era. Constantinople, Alexandria, and Tangiers. Yes, I'm adding in Tangiers. Where else to find me? Twitter. Um, patron. Then you get to vote on this month's, uh, well, next month's now. Um, uh, patron, Naval History Lives. And you can, of course, suggest topics. Usually I have the policy of suggestions first week of the month, then voting second week of the month. We're running slightly late because of various issues, so it's sort of been delayed a bit, but, you know. That's usually the case. And, and global maritime history. Where are some interesting articles, including on Sing Tao? You might enjoy it. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Take care. Please like, share, and subscribe, because I'm supposed to say that. <laughs> and have a nice day, and see you later for the live. It's at 6 o'clock, British Standard, uh, summertime. Take care.